Welcome, LA Progressive friends, families, and readers. I am delighted to have with me here today uh, Gilbert Johnson. Uh, Gilbert is the California Time Done statewide manager. Um, I'm going to let Gilbert uh, give you a little bit of his, a little taste of his resume. Gilbert and I ran into each other a couple of weeks ago. We both, he was on a panel actually, where he was speaking along with several others, um, council member Aonisis Hernandez from C LA City Council uh, District 1 um, convened this panel of some people from Denver, a program called um, STAR, the STAR program in Denver, which is a program that is used to deploy emergency response teams that include emergency medical technicians and behavioral health clinicians. And so Gilbert knows, and Gilbert, he, we, he already, we already cleared this. He has his kids, so he's, he's being daddy and he's he, so he's wearing multiple hats. He's got a couple yeah. of real young ones, a couple of youngins in the room with him. So don't even worry about it, Gilbert. Thank yeah. you for being here, Gilbert. Tell us about yourself and what you know about STAR, and then we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, California for Safety and Justice and the Alliance for Safety and Justice and Time Done. Absolutely. Yeah, two out of my five babies are here <laughs> uh, currently, so it, 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 it's madness, but uh, it's a beautiful thing, especially coming from, you know, um, uh, my background. You know, I was born and raised in South Central LA to, uh, you know, crack parents. I was a crack baby and uh you know dealt with a lot of a lot of family dysfunctionality a lot of abandonment a lot of you know just just trauma from growing up um around the area of the crack epidemic you know i was born in 84 so i i saw it in my family all my uncles aunties i mean alcoholism you know drugs the whole nine so at a young age uh, you know i got in got you know suspended in elementary school kicked out of high school and that's when i was first locked up and sent to uh, my home school crenshaw high school and i kind of cycled in and out of the system um in and out of jail uh, uh till 2009 and that's when i was uh, introduced to community organizing social justice work i had an uncle in reentry that uh, was was uh, what re reentry rehab. He was, uh, you know, um, for, for the readers for the readers that don't know what reentry is, you want to uh, tell definitely, definitely. So basically anybody that's been incarcerated and uh, was released and navigating what uh, we call at time done post conviction poverty. And so uh, there's a clear connection between um, you know, generational poverty for one, but once you get a record and you do your time and you get out, you're also met with thousands of collateral consequences or legal sanctions that actually prevent folks from advancing in life. And that can and does that include fees and, and that kind of thing? Well, that's fines and fees are embedded in the whole criminal legal system, like ecosystem, but um, yes, we fortunately we've passed laws now where, like, say, if you want to get an expungement, you want to get your record cleared or sealed, fines and fees can no longer prevent that. Restitution can no longer prevent that. But for the longest, you'd had have to you couldn't get off parole or probation if you couldn't pay your fees. And the collateral consequence is an employer telling telling you no you can't work here because of your felony or even a misdemeanor. You know, like I was denied employment at the 99 cent store over off of La Cienega, um, you know, and, it, and, and it, it fuels hopelessness. It fuels um, despair because if you have somebody sitting in front of you that's really trying to do the right thing. And my, my cases were drug related. I had one minor burglary charge, but all my other stuff was weed and Cocaine, like I didn't have any violent crimes. I still don't have any violent crimes on my record. I'm sitting here like really trying to do the right thing. And you tell me no, because I have I have to mark that box. Or I can lie and say, no, I don't have a record. And then if you do a background check or, you know, live scan, then it's gonna come back and then you're gonna fire me anyway. So that's just one of the collateral consequences. I mean, there's consequences around housing, um, I've heard it as crazy as if 
you have a felony in a certain state, I forget which state, but if you have a felony on your record and your parents wanted to uh, uh, give you the home, like say they pass away and they leave the home in your name, you can't ha you can't own that home because of your record. That is a collateral consequence. And I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy. But post-conviction poverty is what 80 to 100 million Americans are dealing with. There are like 100 million people in America that have committed some type of crime, whether misdemeanor or felony, and you are met with these legal sanctions or legal restrictions. And it's like, how do you expect people to succeed in life or excel in life if they can't get a stable job or they can't get stable housing, they can't get their family members out of the system with DCFS? I mean, it, yeah, it's, it, it's amazing. I, I heard one young man being interviewed recently where he wanted to accompany his daughter who was in elementary school on a school trip and right. he couldn't do it. Exactly, exactly. And, and, and it's, it's punishment that we're talking about lifetime barriers. Like in the state of California, a felony can stay on your record for a hundred years unless you pursue you know, record clearance, you know, like we just passed and I'm kind of getting into my organization's work time done, but we last year we passed the most powerful expungement bill in the nation where now anybody in the state of California that doesn't have a sex offense, that's the only carve out, but anybody else, I mean, murder, armed robbery, you name it, violent offenses can now be expunged as long as you've been off of parole, you haven't committed any new crimes, you, you know, you have no pending charges, you have to be off parole for two years. And so it's incentivizing good time, like somebody gets out and they can say, well, in three to four years, if I don't do anything wrong, you mean I can go apply to get my record clear and then get a business license and get in the ca cannabis industry? I can own a home and be on my homeowners association, you know, and um, so time done also provides free. We always say we put the free in freedom, but we provide free economic stability workshops and resources to help facilitate that pathway navigating through post conviction poverty. And so that's reentry, um, the long definition of reentry. But uh, I, I meant to say my uncle was in recovery too. He's a recovering addict. And he started out at Community Coalition back when now Mayor Karen Bass was uh, uh, founded. She founded COCO um, with Mark Riley Thomas and some other leaders in the community, some great people. And he started out with that. And he just, he saw me trying to do right. He saw me not getting anywhere. And he said, go down to this community center over on 81st and Vermont, tell them, you know, your Uncle Mel sent you over there and see what, what happens. And sure enough, um, they I started off volunteering. So for, for folks that I know, you got time, you got families, you're busy. Volunteering can lead to great things because I started off just showing up, supporting work, working seasonal part-time positions. And now I'm the state manager for one of the largest public safety or, or, or community safety organizations in the world. You know, and so it just shows like when you stay down, you stay committed and you stay the course, you can work your way up through the ranks and do amazing things I never thought I would be doing. You know, I was homeless. I was a gang member. I was on drugs like my mama and daddy were crackheads. I was smoking crack, popping pills and doing all these crazy things in my really at a young age um, through my 20s until I got connected to that organization that didn't see me as a felon and they didn't see me as they saw me as an individual who made mistakes and was trying to do right and deserve in my case second third fourth chance and I ran with it you know that is so yeah. awesome now yeah. let's talk let's talk a little bit and, and we might come back to this let's talk yeah. a little bit about um the star program in Denver what that's about and why um, Council Member Aenesis Hernandez had you on the panel and had the panelists there in the first place here in Los Angeles. Absolutely. And so um, being at COCO or Community Coalition for seven years, I was engaged in a lot of community based safety work. Um, we do a lot of youth um, development work, you know, breaking school to prison pipelines. And then we did a lot of work around um, folks coming home, 
Um, we do a lot of work to support gang intervention, um, gang prevention with our young folks, you know, and strategies that reduce crime that do not rely on historical approaches to public safety, which we know is law and order, tough on crime, war on drugs, war on black people, war on brown people, war on poor people, so on and so forth. And so this conversation, the conversation and in, in Eunice's uh, reached out to one of my colleagues. I also sit on the um, Los Angeles County Reentry Health Advisory Collaborative, the RAC. And we've been engaged with the uh, alternatives to uh, crisis response work um, really since it started. And so they reached out to us because myself and one of my brothers, uh, Jason Garcia, we frequent those meetings and we've been involved with the crisis response work in LA County um, specifically. So I had never heard of Denver Star prior to uh, them reaching out, you know, CD1 reaching out and trying to find somebody that could speak to what's going on in LA. But from what I heard at that, um that that panel was was pretty amazing because and i saw a lot of alignment because you know one of the ladies she kept bringing up coalition collaboration you know building coalitions bringing folks together bringing organizations from various sectors that do various areas of safety work bringing them together and getting on one page one accord you know maybe not seeing eye to eye all the time but you know, moves, unity, struggle, unity, you know, moving through it, working through it to benefit the community at large. Um, they also had, so Denver Star specifically, they basically send out like trained um, psychologists, social workers to deal with folks who are having mental, you know, episodes of, of mental health, you know, mental instability, a um, lot, of, lot of folks dealing with homelessness so on and so forth. And their, their approach to it was really interesting because they um, they actually partner with law enforcement. And they talked about how there was some pushback at first, but for the most part, where they are now, like the police will call them quick. And they have a really high rate of preventing folks from getting killed. You know, we know what that looks like. Black person interacting with law enforcement, especially LAPD, so on and so forth. People getting killed and diverting people from prison or from jail and into actual community based treatment. And, um, you know, they're, they're, they're funded through through government, I want to say, I, th I think they said they got some philanthropy dollars. And it sounds like work that very similar to what we're doing in L.A. as well. Right, um, right. But one of the um, biggest challenges from my understanding that STAR faced initially is that they wanted to decouple the 911 system from under the umbrella of law enforcement and right. have it separate so that when 911 calls come through, so, uh, they said that the, the calls would be um, divvied up one of three ways. It would either nine one person is calling nine one one. They they either need um, a fire engine or an ambulance, or mm -hmm. they need law enforcement. And now, or they need um, behavioral health clinicians or um, technicians that can deal with mental health issues, poverty, houselessness, substance misuse. So those are the three ways. And in order for them to get. 911 to truly direct those calls in the in the ways that they should be directed they had to take them out from underneath law enforcement and I thought that was interesting right now I okay so you know I was a little late to the panel but I thought they still were like coupled with um law enforcement but I you know I might have missed that part because at yeah, at the end, it seemed like the guy was just saying um, law enforcement loves us now or like, you know, they just they built a rapport with law enforcement and me. I'm not I'm not buddy buddy with the police. You know, I was 14 year old young black man thrown out the car, shotgun to the back of my head. I've witnessed police violence in jail and outside in the streets. So my relationship, you know, I, I'm not a fan of working with law enforcement, but uh, what we did in LA is 988, 
And so that's the so talk to me about 988. Yeah, absolutely. Because that and, and then a lot of the people that do intervention work, a lot of the people that are out there putting their lives on the line daily to, you know, stop gang violence or prevent community violence, domestic violence. They don't they also don't want to work with law enforcement and uh, L.A. County knew that. So through the alternatives to incarceration work years in the making, um, big shout out to uh, former supervisor Mark Riley Thomas for kind of spearheading that and, and supervisor Sheila Kuehl for their role in initiating the alternatives to incarceration work. Basically through that work, through a whole plethora of community engagement, town halls, us going down to the board of supervisors, internal meetings at COCO and at Black Lives Matter and external meetings down at the county, we came up with over a hundred recommendations that went into a, a report, the ATI report, and the board unanimously unanimously adopted that um, report. So big shout out to to a lot of the, the orgs, you know, Justice LA, um, um, Dignity and Power Now, you know, some of the folks that we threw down with to get to the place like Measure J. You know, now it's actually we have money to fund ATI. So a lot of this stuff is building. You're talking about decades of organizing, decades of continuing to show up, you know, so on and so forth to now the county adopted those recommendations and like there was a whole section around community, uh, uh, alternative community crisis response that did not rely on sheriffs, you know, because in the county, the sheriffs oversee the county and the city, LAPD oversees the city, mm -hmm. they, they, they listen. So this whole other entity 988 was created where now, you know, some of the numbers that we got on the last um, community alternative crisis response, like 988 gets like 5,000 calls um, a month and they have like a 95% of those calls being resolved and folks getting, you know, funneled to beds, you know, if they're dealing with houselessness, funneled to um, D.D. Hirsch or, or NAMI, I'm blanking on the, the acronym for NAMI, but they're one of the biggest like mental health organizations yes. in L.A., you know, and so they have a really high rate of actually serving the people. And 988 actually came out of a motion that was uh, championed by Supervisor Hahn, and I, I think that it was somebody else who signed on. They supported it unanimously, but I wanted to, you know, shout that out because the progressive leadership, LA progressive, right? The progressive leadership that we've seen over the years has truly moved us in a different direction to where now cops aren't showing up gun drawn for somebody that has a knife in their hand and, you know, is obviously need, in need of help, you know, and we've still seen that. We've still seen that. And that's why on the city side, there's work being done um, to also build out the alternative crisis response. I want to say that work was started when Herb Wesson was still a council member and he had a motion like calling for this. And we were exploring other models uh, like the cahoots program that was brought up a couple of times at the panel discussion. That's all community led. The issue is a lot. It was a lot of volunteerism. And we're like, no, people have been doing this work on the ground for decades. Like, no, pay them the salary that the police are getting or something close to it. Give right. them medical benefits, health benefits. Give them a pension, too, because they're out here. And, you know, important, important note. I'll see if you had any other questions. Important note is that LAPD and the sheriffs, they give a lot of recognition to gang interventionists. You know, like um, folks, Advocates for Peace for Urban Unity, the Reverence Project, uh, Second Call, development, Developing Options, like all these organizations that have been doing work for years, they give credit to them for reducing crime and making our community safer, safer, but the money doesn't follow that credit. And so we're like, no, time out for that, pay our people, train up our people, just like a police officer goes through paid training and then gets that salary position. Like, why can't we do that with people that have been doing this work in the community and also have a deeper connection to the community 
One, because we come from it, but also we've been through the same issues. Been shot, been to prison, been to jail. You know, I know your uncle. I knew your daddy over there who got caught up in the in the drug war. You know, so and that that individual listened more so rather than you know an officer showing up, um, trying to play the role of of, of the you know a hero. Whatnot, so, so let me let me just restate some of the things that we've been talking about for our um, our listeners and our readers. I have with me here today uh, Gilbert Johnson, and we've been talking about the Star Program, which is a program that is deployed out of uh, Denver, Colorado. But they recently visited Los Angeles, where um, there was a panel session, a discussion, and really basically um, an opportunity for the community to get educated about this program and Gilbert was on the panel. And when one of the things that the STAR program does is it employs local small um, community organizations that are already doing work to help people who are in crisis situations, people who are experiencing um, grotesque, severe uh, poverty, houselessness, substance misuse, mental health issues. There are so many uh, community-based organizations that are already doing this work. And what they do with the STAR program is they actually pay those organizations. And instead of calling the police for these kinds of crises, and, and the kinds of crises we're talking about is crises where there, there is no um, imminent risk to life, um, just like what was just described by Gilbert, where someone is, it has a knife and maybe they're having a, a mental health crisis. We don't need the police to come out with their guns ready. What you need is um, perhaps a health cl a clinician or a, a medical technician. And so, yeah, so this is exciting. Now, 988, um, Gilbert sort of introduced me to that 988 when we saw each other at the panel session. Right. I'm sorry, I was telling my son to stop. Yeah, no worries. So 988, so someone just needs to, like you would call 911, you'd call 988. Now, what would be the difference between calling 911 and calling 988? So, and, you know, it's it's pretty alarming because, uh, you know, I ask folks to raise their hand. How many people have heard of 988? And not even, no, not even a third of the room. Okay heard of it you know and it's it's wild because it's having a powerful impact no no system is perfect but it's getting there you know more the more funding that gets there the more capacity we have to take more calls to increase hours so on and so forth we're creating something that's really community centered and community driven i always say like you can't have public safety without the public and it's organizations like our csj that's on the ground keeping the public in public safety keeping the community firsthand in community safety and 988 is a testament to that because you know they have um field intervention teams you know it's a partnership between uh dd hirsch and they get a call and they basically um they'll answer the call dd hirsch you know is la pretty large mental health uh and substance abuse co-occurring disorder um, program, they've been around forever. Um, but they take the call, if if necessary, they'll connect someone to um, like a Department of Mental Health, uh, what's called the Access Helpline. Then to uh, what's the PMRT, that's the Psychiatric Mobile Response Team. And so all, these teams are being built out and, and with minimum capacity, they're still having a profound impact, but just imagine when we scale it up and there's um, these are the field intervention teams, the PMRT, and then there's a, 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 a contracted mobile crisis outreach team where they send folks out to the scene, but law enforcement is a last resort. You know, law enforcement is only called when there's like, you know, a serious threat of violence. You know, and, and, you know, so, so be it, it is what it is. Um, but the whole idea is to pre prevent people from being harmed um, and further victimized and criminalized uh, and have people be seen as a human with dignity, with 
you know, it, they, we have needs. People had needs. I had needs when I was um, homeless and, and on drugs and sleeping in Lamar Park. You know, I had needs. They weren't being met because the systems at that time weren't, you know, they, they're not, they're still not funded to this day to where they should be. Like, just imagine, that's why Karen Bass created Coco. It was all about implementing a public health approach to issues, deep issues in the community fueled by historical poverty, fueled by disinvestment, fueled by a lack of care from elected officials historically, you know, full by fueled by all these things, you know, public health approach to crime and violence in our community looks much different than police coming in with battle rams, you know, in the 90s. I remember the 92 um, um, Rodney King, the uprising, you know, tanks driving through our community, them knocking down doors, and it's not even, they're looking for somebody that don't even live there, like crazy stuff that we went through. Um, imagine if we had trained clinicals, psychologists, and yeah. social workers out there, you know, um, and so it's, a, it's, it's a different conversation, but to talk a little bit more, um, there are about 33 um, PMRT teams, so the psych psychiatric uh, mobile response teams, and there's two of those mobile crisis outreach teams. Um, and so there's 35 field intervention teams now that are working in um, lockstep with 988, um, and there's about 95 clinicians um, assigned to law enforcement um, who, you know, we, we hear a lot of the times they're there to criminalize folks, but it's a mixed bag. It's like they say you got bad apples in every department or whatnot. But we're saying, like, have that be all community led, all community driven, all community people that are trained up in conflict resolution, trained up in mediation, trained up in trauma um, uh, you know, relativity, trained up in mm -hmm. cultural sensitivity, the whole nine, implicit bias, all this stuff that law enforcement is trying to do now, like our people, we know it because we've been through it, you know, just give us some more training and we'll do it. We'll probably, we'll do a better job time than y'all nine times out of 10. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I mean, especially people like you, where your education comes from experience. I'm sure yeah. you you know you understand these situations on a on a, a level that even you know people who are clinicians may yeah. not understand the depth may not have the depth of your understanding. And I mentioned that on that panel too. Like the conditions in South Central are, are far different than Denver, you know, Colorado. Um, and and I lifted that, and they acknowledged that too. Yes, they did. And I lifted that because it speaks to the importance and necessity of having that lived experience in the field, you know, showing up um, from a place of care first, rather than jail first or, or, or fear. first, yeah. fear first, fear tactics. Oh, my God, that's we could get into a whole nother conversation around sheriffs, gangs and you know, the, our check the sheriff work. Shout out to you know ACLU, all our partners in the check the sheriff space, BLMLA. But it just creates a, a different culture. It's like we're trying to shift the culture from systemic violence to systemic well-being. Like we we have a a, a mantra, and I encourage you to go check out uh, Just Safe. Dot org. It's a big campaign that we launched earlier this year with Jennifer Lewis, but she opens up by saying Close your safety eyes. is more than the absence and of imagine crime. A time the presence you of felt wealth. safe. I always was safe with my brother. Safe is being seen, feeling heard. I feel safe when I'm able to provide for my family. Seguridad es cuando tenemos todo lo que necesitamos. To not feel safe makes you feel hopeless. I was in an abusive relationship. I've lost two brothers to gun violence. I still feel that pain today. Mi hijo fue asesinado por la policía injustamente. Safety is more than the absence of crime. It is the presence of well-being. What helped stop my life with crime was resources. 
Just Save is about investing in things that make us all feel safe. I feel safe when my family is home together. Visit JustSafe.org and tell us what safety means to you. Well-being and what does well-being look like? At um, California for Safety and Justice, we have a uh, uh, activity that we do with folks. We simply ask folks to close their eyes and imagine a time when they felt the most safe. People are not saying when it was police everywhere and sirens and they were knocking down our door and they threw my uncle on the ground because he was, you know, had a gun. Like, no, it's uh, quinceañeras, it's backyard picnics, it's barbecues at the park, it's graduation ceremonies. You know, it's it's more community oriented. And, you know, that, that narrative shift work is so important because that's like one of our why we do what we do is about shifting the narrative about who we can be when our communities are well resourced is one thing I learned from my brother Bobby Keeley with Black Lives Matter Los Angeles is like the most resourced communities tend to be the safest communities. Because there's right. money, there's affluency there, there's programs there, there's what you need there, you know, and so. Yeah, well, um, I, I think that um, we're going to end this interview on that point. Because that's what it all boils down to is economic justice. That's and if important. we had if, if we had more economic justice, we'd need we I don't even think we'd need police. But yeah. that's another interview. Well a whole other conversation <laughs> when I put you, um, with you though, sister, on that. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Well, Gilbert Johnson, thank you for being with me today and talking to us about time done and yeah. about California's safety and justice and the STAR program. I look forward to following your career. Oh, go ahead. Did you did you want to say something else? Yeah, just wanted to make sure to your point around economic justice, like Tom Dunn's work is really rooted in creating economic mobility and economic stability with our membership. And again, all our stuff is free. Tom Dunn is in that fastest growing community of people with records. So visit timedone.org along with Just Safe um, and safeandjust.org. But visit Time Done if you want to get plugged into our free resources. I mean, there's credit building, wealth building, how to budget, you know, um, how to own a home, how the whole process. If you need a job, we can give you resources and point you in that direction. Um, if you need a background check, you know, if you need your record clear, like it's a lot that we're doing at Time Done in collaboration with, you know, a lot of great folks like Homeboy Industries anti-recidivism coalition and new way of life some of our longtime partners but we're on the ground y'all we're out there and we really care and we really want our, our folks to be well well so. that's good to know well thank yeah. you so much gilbert johnson and you. um looking forward to seeing all the fantastic things that you and your organizations are going to be doing in the future thank you for being with us so long uh -huh.